You know this guy, Farhan Lalji from TSN, but what you don't know is, or you may not know, is that he's a parent, he's a coach, he's a program builder, he's an activist for the game in this country. Farhan, welcome to Gridiron Nation. Jim, it's been too long since we've done this. Yeah, it has been. And I'll tell you, I got a surprise for you, breaking news as we record this. <laughs> oh, wow. As of about three minutes ago, uh, I am officially no longer president of Football Canada, which wow. allows us to have a wonderful open discussion about the state of football in this country. Well, truthfully, I think that's a loss for Football Canada and a loss for football in this country because I think you've done a fabulous job during your time. Uh, as president, um, I know you've been selfless and well-intentioned with all of it, and your love for the game is what drove you and nothing else. And, I, you know, I know you had to deal with some stuff earlier this year in the spring and a lot of agenda and silliness that went with that, and I think some misguided people. But if they know you like I know you, and we've known each other since the 80s, which tells us how old we are. Um, I know what you're all about, so thank you for everything you did for football in this country. Well, at least one of us has kept our hair through all of this, which is, <laughs> uh, I think, absolutely key. And thank you for the kind words. It, it does allow us, though, to have a discussion about the state of the sport in this country. And you and I have had discussions over the last three decades uh, about the state of the sport. And I think we've moved in our positions uh, on some key issues. You know, as a, as a parent... And as a coach, what is your view about where football is in Canada right now and and what the deficiencies are and what some of the solutions might be moving forward uh, to create more growth in the sport and uh, better support for the sport? Wow, that's a big question, a really big question. And I say that because I think that it's it's such a layered issue. And I think it's a different issue in different parts of the country, right? Um, you know, um, out here in British Columbia, you know, I, when I when I look at it, um, I think the game hasn't necessarily moved forward at the grassroots level the way it should. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of the same sport that it was. And you've got a lot of these community associations that are in it. And you've got a small group of people that are leading it. And, you know, you tend to wind up with the same, uh, you know, political problems and machinations when you've got parent led groups. Uh, and so what does that come down to? Well, to me, a lot of that comes down to money, right? Because if you have finances in place and you can pay some people to run uh, some key jobs, and I'm not talking at the provincial level, right? I, I do think there are people provincially that do a good job, but ultimately they're reliant on a number of smaller groups and smaller associations and smaller entities that don't always have consistency, that don't always have a growth mindset. They're trying to just, you know, keep it on the rails for lack of a better description. And then, you know, I, I think the um, the most important part of it here in British Columbia is the high school gr uh, group. And the high school football has been growing. But for me, I, I think the biggest challenge there isn't necessarily money, but it's it's trying to get coaches and it's trying to get paid coaches and trying to uh, put the school system in a position where they can hire coaches to build programs and to make programs better. Uh, so I think that's part of it in BC. Obviously, the loss of Simon Fraser University is a huge blow uh, to the sport in this country, but specifically in this province, you know, the thought for me that um, the province of British Columbia has one football team, and that's not to discredit UBC. I think they do a great job. Blake Mills, one of the best coaches in the country, but it's more a case of how does the Maritimes have four teams and BC has one, right? Just from a population standpoint, the number of kids playing. So I think that's got to change And whether a second program comes to SFU or we find another university that's that's willing to, uh, to take it on and, and love it and care for it and do the right things, which SFU clearly wasn't, um, you know, I, I, I hope that those things happen. So it's layered. And then, you know, around the country, it's different. And from a big picture standpoint, and as a parent of a kid that's going through it, you know, we, uh, we moved, right? Like we put our, we, I put my son in, in a U.S. high school football program. As I often say, we kind of got half pregnant. Right, because we didn't move to like one of the power states and go really far where, where he could get even more exposure, but we put him in a place where he would still get better exposure than if he was anywhere in Canada. So I, I hate the thought that people around the country feel the need to do this, but that's kind of where we're at, right? That, that, that people feel the need that if they want to get to that point, that they've got to change their exposure level in order to get to that point, because that doesn't do the sport any good in the country. So again, a lot of layers that, that go into this, as you know. You talk about parents feeling the need to send their uh, kids to uh, American programs, whether they're academies, high schools, uh, you know, as young as in some cases, grade nine. Uh, 
uh, as we've seen. Lamar Goods was uh, was a player that uh, left Fort McMurray at uh, at that age. What can be done to turn that tide around in this country? I'm thinking at the core of it, it is coaching development, but it may even go deeper than that because of the approach that we have to everything being volunteerism. There is a level of uh, coaching that needs to be professionalized in this country. And I'm not sure if there is that vision or commitment out there in these communities that are willing to go down that path. Well, I I think you're right. But I also think that um, some of it is numbers, right? Like there has to be a critical mass that wants it in order for it to happen. So I also live the minor hockey life. Right. So my son played for newest minor hockey. We eventually wanted to get him into a more competitive situation. So we took him to Burnaby Winter Club. And then from there, um, you know, and, and throughout all of that, he was involved in spring hockey, which is fully private. And we were fortunate that even though we were you know, paying a significant sum, we had people around him that, that did care about him and developed relationships with him. And still, you know, coaches to this day from his, his AAA spring hockey program that reach out and want to know how he's doing in football. And they, they genuinely cared about him. So we were fortunate, but you know, the, the number of private hockey coaches in this country that are driving cars a lot nicer than mine and yours, right? It's it's amazing because there's always parents that were are willing to pay the freight, and so these guys can do very well and make this their job, and good for them. I don't begrudge them at all, but um, you know, there there is a lot of politicization to that where. You know, they've, they've got agendas of, of, you know, who they can bring in that can drive their brand forward and drive their bottom line forward. So, you know, it's not like it makes it clean, but it does legitimately make it high performance because all of these coaches invest in themselves in terms of making sure they can develop at a high level. And so when you see the amount of money being spent, and it's ridiculous that families feel the need to mortgage their, their homes, take out second mortgages so their kid can go to a hockey academy, um, so, you know, th- there is a negative to it because you get a number of athletes that simply will never be able to access hockey at the highest level. And you talk about racism in hockey, the biggest color in hockey is green, right? It's, it's not about black, white, brown. It's about green. So as long as you have the funds, you can access this game at the highest level. Whereas in football, you mentioned the culture of volunteerism. We do everything we can to keep the cost down and, I'll give you the example of of the soccer world in this country because it's passing football in terms of kids committing to it at a high performance level at an earlier age because, you know, when we were kids, people played soccer because it was cheap and safe and everyone looked the same doing it, right? And it was the first sport you played and it was the first sport you gave up. Well, now at an early age, kids are staying in soccer because the sport culturally has now decided to charge more. Right. So it's, it's whether you're playing minor soccer or whether you're in one of these academy programs, that's cropping up left and right because so many kids are playing it. You know, you wind up charging more and keeping kids in it. So now the kids think they invested. So for me, when my son was playing soccer and hockey at the same time, or sorry, football and hockey at the same time, I was the football coach. And I said, go play hockey. Like when, when there was a choice to be made for a tryout or, or a football practice, I, as the football coach, sent my kid to the hockey tryout. Right. Because I knew that, you know, we were investing more into that and there was it was more competitive in that. And so, you know, we, we need to get to a stage where we can have a critical mass of kids playing so that you can create a demand. Because I have people coming to me and saying, How, what do you think of me starting a football academy? And, and, you know, and I say to them from a business model, are there enough kids doing it for you to financially make it work? Forget the philosophical ramifications, but. Are there enough kids to doing it? We're doing it that you can have a business. So, you know, I think it starts there, right? Uh, just more kids playing so that we can we can have demand for high performance. Uh, I'm still with IFAF. I'm the general secretary there. And I was just in Finland at the World Flag Championships. Uh, at the high performance level, it is jumping in leaps and bounds. And the reason I bring flag up is you're talking about building that critical mass Uh, in terms of numbers, hockey and soccer reach kids at the age of six, seven, and eight. Is flag the tool, at least generationally, to get those numbers into the system so parents can make a choice at the age of 11, 12, 13 to either play tackle, play flag, or even play both? I don't know. Uh, You know, truthfully, because I, I know that a lot of people believe it's the entry point, but I also feel at times it's the exit point. 
right? Whereas if that choice is there, then they'll go play flag and they won't play tackle. And they're missing out on the benefits of tackle, which is more than simply the tackling, right? When, when you have that number, right? To me, the, the best part about football is the number of kids on a given team and what that lends itself to from a, a multicultural and a socioeconomic development standpoint um, and just the teamwork involved as opposed to a five-on-five -five flag game. Um, so I, I'm not convinced. I mean, look, from a brand standpoint and a marketing standpoint, I get why the NFL and CFO want to lead into flag football because it could, buy, it could sell more jerseys and it could create more viewers. I get it. Uh, but I'm not certain. And, and I, I'm not telling you it's not, but I'm not certain because for – for the number of people that view it as an entry point, I still see the other side of it as an exit point that we don't have to do tackle, we can just do flag, and I think that's a negative for this game. Uh, we were shoulder to shoulder in terms of the battle to try to keep uh, SFU football on the field last yes. year. Um, it was very challenging. Uh, I thought we were very successful in terms of getting the message out and the value out about what a uh, football program brings to a university. But what is the solution? We, we leaned into it a little bit uh, earlier in terms of BC only having one university or college football team. What is the path forward on this, whether it's at SFU or some other school? And is there interest in the community, at least from some of these universities or leaders in the community? Well, I you know, I, I know there's a bunch of people that I'm close to that are still SFU alumni and are involved in that. And I'm an SFU alum myself. Um, and, and I'm not convinced it's SFU. And, and I say that because the university administration clearly doesn't want it. If, if you look at who's president and who's manning those chairs in the, in the upper reaches of administration, they think differently. And uh, they don't see the value. And quite frankly, I'm not sure they see the value of intercollegiate athletics at all. I, I think they're keeping some of it around because they kind of feel compelled to and football was a sacrificial lamb um but yeah when, when i look at the people that are in leadership positions at that university and that university is failing on so many levels uh you know there, there's a lot of people on that campus that are not happy with leadership at all now good for them they got a medical school going and a degree at sfu still means something but in terms of the overall campus experience and other things going on there they, it, it's not it so for me, I, I would love to get into a situation with a school like Fraser Valley or, or uh, you know, uh, in Victoria at um, UVic or even in the Okanagan and see if we can find a place that's looking to really grow. Uh, you know, when you look at how football um, increases the visibility of a university at all levels, I know we're not in the U.S., but you know, when you look at what that does for enrollment and things like that, if you can do things successfully, uh, the amount of things that football can connect to it, right? Like people talk about it being, you know, all about males. It's not, right? Because there are so many other parts to running a successful football team where anybody can be involved in. And when you look at, uh, you know, the, the inclusivity on the First Nations side and with ethnic minorities and things like that, there's not a more inclusive sport than football. And if you can get somebody with the right growth mindset at one of these other universities, because you know what? SFU doesn't deserve football. No, no. And, and I hope one of these other schools does. Yeah, and... Uh, the other question then is, where does it land? Does it land in the United States somewhere? Does it land in the Canada West? Um, well, it, you know, it, it depends. Like if a school like Trinity Western were to do it for the sake of argument, um, and, you know, the fact that it's a Christian school, and, you know, when you look at the NAIA, uh, that has quite a, quite a lot of that, right? Like I think I think there could be some alignment there. However, the other Trinity Western programs are in Canada West, right? So for me, it's not even about that anymore. Like I believed in what SFU was doing, both in the NAIA when you were you and I were both employees of that school, uh, and now when it got into the NCAA, like I, I believed in having one school in Canada playing in the United States, but not as you've got to fund it if you're going to do that. Uh, you can't fund it at the level SFU was being funded at. I mean, they were taking a knife to a gunfight, right? Um, so there was no re there was no surprise that it was failing. So it really depends on what that school wants to invest in. And if you want to go in the States, I think there's benefits to that. But if they play in Canada West, that's fine too. More importantly, we just need a second program for this problem.